Good evening, everyone. It's Maggie Bot here um, a couple days after Sasquatch Games Festival is over. So here in Seattle, we have a small game thing that's called Sasquatch, and it's five days, so it's pretty intense. Um, and a wonderful woman out here named Jennifer brings all SN releases she can think of back to the States, so about 150 titles or so. And uh, about, you know, 100 to 200 of us here in Seattle have access to this amazing game library and you just sit and game for a few days. Uh, so, you go into this room thinking, oh, I gotta play this, this, and this, and this, but in reality, because of the length of games I play, I didn't really play that many games, but I did get an opportunity to try stuff that I had wanted to try, and I wanted to go over what I had played, good or bad. So, <laughs> lengthy introduction. Um, we will start out with, let's start with just the two games that were kind of disappointments and then we can get to the more interesting stuff. So, uh, I'm gonna say this one, Haspel Connect or Haspel Connect. And, and this, so this is a Spitzer game from the same series as Colon and Colony and Russia for Hurt. I don't know how to say that one. Um, so the the previous two games were Spielworks titles, and this one is not. And it's kind of telling in that if I didn't tell you any of that and you played the game, there's no way you would have picked that out of a lineup for a Spitzer title. It's not complicated. It's rather straightforward. Um, it feels like you're going to solve the game in a couple of plays. So in general, everyone has a coal mine on their property um, and a little bit of coal above ground and you have to deal with the pit water that comes up when you mine coal. And then you're kind of buying technologies off to the side that will help or hinder your progress. So the coal mining in general is not that rewarding. It's good, not great. Um, everyone in our very first play got either all the way through or like me a significant way through their their mine and the technology tree you just kind of you see symbols and you're going to get points for those and you get points for being the first person to buy them and honestly it just it lacked another one that just lacked some pizzazz if you didn't tell me anything about the game before I started I probably would have assumed it was a Z-Man title it felt kind of like the midway Z-Man they, they like their tiles they like their trees um, it just it felt like after you know even one or two plays you're just never gonna you're not gonna need anymore uh, you've kind of figured everything out I was saying this about Hi Taboo so this is a Spielworks title um, it is interesting. So High Taboo is a Vikings game in which they have made a worker placement where half the worker placement spots are risky half the time and you kind of rotate the little dial so uh, the good or the bad rotates with it. Um, and then you're trying to get goods, transport your goods, and sell your goods. It feels similar to a very edited Imperial Settlers where everything takes X amount of steps where normally in some games you would just be able to buy a resource but this one feels like you must count your money, associate, like bring your money together, walk to the market, ask the guy a question, pick out the merchandise, buy the merchandise. It just everything fell into step after step after step after step. So in High Taboo, you can acquire the cubes pretty slowly. You either acquire a lot of one color or a little bit of lots, and there's a market. So the prices fluctuate. If I buy from it, the prices are going to go up. The prices only go down if I spend actions to sell goods that not only have I acquired, but I've also transported, which took two more actions. So. It just, and then at the end of every round, you basically have a mechanic trying to get the prices back to normal. Everything in the game is built to try and kind of stabilize those prices toward the middle. Everything was 18 steps, and the amount of take that that there is is ridiculous. So, as I said, there are there are safe worker placement spots and not safe worker placement spots, but plenty of ways of mitigating the luck of that. So I would have to roll a die if I want one of the nighttime spots. But there's a character that allows me to roll two dice and keep whichever one I want. And most of the 
roles I would get are not negative toward me, but some of them will steal goods from other players, transports from other players, so giant, huge actions from other players. And it's, it was just a rough game. So by the end of the game, I was buying extra goods in case anyone hit me, like cheap goods in case someone hit me with one of those dice rolls, and relying on being able to buy a transport card and transport goods all within one round because any any goods sitting around the transport might might go away um, but I, I played this with myself and two friends that I know from out here in Seattle and then uh, Daryl Andrews from the Toronto area and over the game <laughs> we sat there and talked about how fiddly it all felt and how disappointing it was that the game wasn't better. Um, honestly, I think if they took out one of the steps on one of the actions, it would have been much better. Having to buy transports and then use another step to transport those goods, if the one action would allow you to transport specific goods, that would be enough, but you're buying specific colors, you're buying transports that only transport specific colors, you're transporting goods, and then you're selling to contracts. And most contracts is a nominal amount of points, so it's not even that well set up for you to want to sell contracts. It's, it's a rough game. Let's just get to the good stuff, because I played a lot of amazing things. Uh, the one surprise um, that I found was Jiraku and this was recommended by other people to me. Um, it is from Taiwan, I believe. Um, Modifius or Modifius or Modius designs. Um, this one is a trick-taking game. Uh, so everyone has uh, colored cards. There's three different colors. They're one to six, and there is a ninja in each color. Um, and you play a regular trick-taking round. So I play a two blue. If you have blue, you have to follow the same color. And if you don't have the same color, you can play anything you like. The highest card, not necessarily card lead, but the highest card total will take the trick. If you play a ninja, it's basically a zero unless there was a six present and then it counts as a seven. So ninjas are an interesting mix. But every time you lay down a card, you're going to affect a board. So you have a board with seven regions and a daimo in one and samurai cubes. So every time you lay down a card, it's gonna let you either add cubes to the board, move your cubes around, or eat enemy cubes wherever your dymo is. And then there are three rounds in the game, and each round there is an incentive. You're gonna be scoring each of the regions, and at the beginning of the game, it's better to be on the right, and then toward the end of the game, it's better to be all the way on the left. So you're gonna be moving around the board trying to get majorities, but every trick you take is going to score one region where your dymo is, and that's majority scoring. So even if you're there, but other people have more stuff there, you won't win that trick. Really interesting. I have already pre-ordered that from Fun Again. Um, they had it for about $39, so it's a little bit much for a trick-taking game, but it is import only at the moment without a license for the states. Um, I've definitely seen it around. Uh, next, so the other one I ordered one was the Deluvia Project, which is Spielworks' newest uh, game other than High Taboo. So the Deluvia Project has a completely paced on theme, sorry if anyone disagrees, but you are building a city in the clouds, so on the board you can see like a top down, you have clouds all around and you can see these little propellers that are keeping the city afloat. When you build, you have to build um, adjacent to somewhere you already are or next to a propeller that you own. Uh, the beginning of each round is bidding on columns and rows of a board that contain contains tiles. It's kind of like Targi where if I'm on one side you can't be directly opposite me, but there's going to be a timing issue where if I'm first in the turn order, I have access to this entire row. If you've got this column, you're not going to see maybe one of the tiles where I purchased out from under you. So you get a small dollar incentive if someone purchases a tile and you have fewer tiles to choose from. Really interesting stuff. And then you take those tiles or actions and you buy stuff and you take over spaces and then you build over spaces and there's a little bit of take that and these cool gardens that no one really owns but they increase your scoring. It was very fun. 
I look forward to future plays of that. I did witness one game where players had run out of um, tiles to populate that first area with, and there's nothing really to address that in the rules, so we're waiting to hear back from Uli about it. I gotta say, I was already gonna be predisposed to this one anyway, was the Gallerist, the Gallerist from Vitalis Cerda and Eagle Griffin Games. So this was a Kickstarter a while back. Vital wanted to make this as beautiful as he possibly could, and you know what? It is. It is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you have everything from this giant oversized board, really thick, they're like three millimeter cardboard pieces, and you have your works of art in your gallery, and everything is just lovely. And there's lots of wood bits, and everything is really well done. The one thing that they may have considered, but I think they wanted to keep it as neutral as possible, or that the artist cards, the artists that you're building their fame for, are not a picture of anyone. They don't they don't have actual faces. It's just kind of a generic looking guy or girl, which is just fine and I think that was part of their aesthetic, but there there lacked a little bit of pizzazz, especially because the art on the art cards is about this big, even though the card is about that big, because there are people at the gallery kind of staring at it, which is fine. But I, I would have maybe liked to see some faces on my artists. Um, so the gameplay itself uh, it is very interesting. It's similar to Kanban. It's a worker placement game where you only place one worker. So in the board, everyone has a gallery, a lobby, and then there's like a plaza in the middle. And what you're trying to do is entice visitors into your gallery. The three different types of visitors either pay out in fame, in wealth, or they buy paintings from you. So you also need to discover new artists, purchase art to put into the gallery, and maybe sell off that art later if it comes to a good price. Everyone's given little objective cards at the beginning of the game saying if at the end of the game in your gallery you have this type of art or if sold you have this type of art you're going to get extra points. And then you have your one worker. And you take your one worker and you put them out on the board and there's uh, different spaces around the board that have two actions associated with them each. So I place it out on the board, I take one of the two actions. Then I don't remove it, I leave it where it is. If in between my turn and my next turn someone wants to kick my guy out, I get a kicked out action. So kicked out actions are twofold. They can either be your free actions called executive actions that you could have taken any round, it's just a free time to do so. Or you can knock yourself back to the next multiple of five on the fame track and take a full action from that space. Um, the fame track, if you can wield it well, you're going to get up to like, maybe I get six and then I can knock myself only back one space to take a full action. So it's a lot of timing and very tricky stuff. Um, the game itself was lovely, but over way too fast for my first play. I totally look forward to future plays and to some strategy guides or something online. Um, uh, I got to play my second play of Nippon. Uh, so that is a four player game and that is from Paolo and Nuno And What's Your Game. Uh, Nippon has one of the greatest uh, worker action selection type mechanics I've seen in a long time. So out of a bag, you draw a bunch of meeples and there's different colors and you kind of put them on the board. So three here, three here, three here, three here. And you kind of line up what's gonna come out after that. Then each turn you can either grab a meeple or let your meeples go. So if you grab a meeple, you get to take whatever action is below it. If you let your meeples go, it's called consolidate. You get some cleanup, some income to figure stuff out. But what you're going to have to do every time you consolidate is you're going to have to pay for all of the different colors of meeples you used in the last round. So if you used one color, great, it costs three, but if you used four different colors, it's going to cost you 12. So every time you take an action, you're going to be looking for colors that you can kind of combine one after another after another to do the actions that you'd like to do without anyone else screwing you over. Really, really cool stuff. Um, What's Your Game is just consistently good, heavy fun. Uh, I can't wait for my copy to arrive. I did pre-order that one as well. Having a little trouble with some, some purchases. I purchased a lot of games lately. Um, 
Then my first play of Food Chain Magnet from Splatter Games. I played um, a four player game of Food Chain Magnet. Uh, so in this game, you are competing food chain restaurants or chains really. Um, so I had, you know, my little my little diner here and somebody had theirs here and theirs here and theirs here. And what you're trying to do each round is both advertise and bring in customers and also provide the food those customers want exactly as well as the best price. So the whole board is tiles and the game checks how far you are away from a customer affected by advertising. So somebody had to make the advertisement, choose the type of food, then at the end of the round, the customer is affected by that advertisement, and then the next round, they're gonna go out looking for whatever mix of foods had reached them through advertising. You, as your restaurant, needed to have built uh, cooks and drink manufacturers enough to provide those goods and so the distance you are from the customer plus the price that you're offering it's like a base 10 and then you can offer discounts on it by building cards is going to tell you where that customer might go and the number of people working in your restaurant is your tiebreaker so your waitresses all of these things are cards on a tech tree so waitresses and chefs and advertising and managers and the number of people in your company, all of that is a card tech tree. So you have your little menu and you're like, okay, so if I buy this junior executive, I can get to the vice president, can get to the CFO, you know, like uh, you're gonna be trading up your cards as you go. But these cards are limited, so every time you take one, you're taking them away from other people, but if you put it back, you're putting it back into the pool. So in our game, the waitresses went really fast. Um, there were none of them by about mid-game. And that's gonna affect you a lot. That's your tie breaks. So uh, I can't, can't recommend enough watching out for how many waitresses you've taken. Um, you also need people to hire more cards. You need the number of hires you have is equal to the number of guys that say hire an employee. And then you need to train them, which is how you trade them up. And so you need guys that say train an employee. And it's just, it's beautiful splatter tech tree wonderfulness. Um, so for my first game, I was playing against one person who had played and three who had not, or four who had not. Unfortunately or fortunately, it turned out to be a pretty normal splatter where about midway through the, the person who grokked it the best and then the person who had played it before both started just taking over the game and the others of us in the game were very quickly being taken out. And so one person decided to leave the game mid-game. It was a public event and that's okay. Um, I unfortunately, before, about two turns before the game would have ended, I ran out of actions. I literally just didn't have enough money to do anything but sit there and cry <laughs> to myself. So um, it was an interesting first play. I look forward to future plays, but it's definitely going to be one where the more someone has played it, the more they're going to stomp other people. So you want to have everyone at least on a somewhat even playing ground. So. Testing this game and seeing how I feel about it. It's gonna take some time I think because it's gonna have to be where I teach a lot of my friends how to play and we get into our second or third plays of it It's not a very long game. It was only two two and a half hours. So it's nothing crazy nothing five hours long or anything but it's gonna take some some space on a table and some time. It also was missing one player aid I feel that could have helped you know what the milestones were in the game. So if you're the first person to have to throw away food, or you're the first person to get a drink, you're the first person to do this or that, you're gonna get these milestone cards which are permanent benefits and those are really important. Um, they don't recommend those in the basic game but we started with the advanced game because I like to see the full scope of a game if I'm going to know whether or not I want to continue playing it. But Luckily, I own Food Chain Magnet, so I will have ample opportunity to play that in the future. Uh, next, I'm just going right through my little played list here. Um, Sasquatch does a really good job. They have you kind of check in and log your plays and who you played with and who taught the game and maybe how long the game was so you don't you don't lose it afterwards, so you don't have to go, I've done this many times, go back through your pictures on your phone to try and figure out which games you played. It's good. Uh, next. 
So this was a hit of Sasquatch. I will say um, very few games had this kind of impact, and that was Mombasa from r and Games. Mombasa was really interesting stuff. So uh, you have a board, and on the board you have four different companies, and the four different companies have a stock stock track associated with them, and those are randomized and they have different um, abilities on them. The crux of the game is really your card management, your hand management, so um, your board starts out and you have two different sections. You have kind of a library of books and you have a diamond track. Every time you earn a diamond in the game, you go up on your diamond track. Every time you get a book, you put the books on your book track and then you have to find a way to get past them, which is I won't go into that in this vlog. I'll go into that if I do something more in detail. So that's the two different tracks you have. And both of those tracks, when you're about midway on, will open up more action cards that can be played on a turn. But you start the game with three cards. So every turn, you're going to put down three cards face down, and everyone's going to reveal them at the same time. And then when your turn comes up, you can use your cards, right? Like one by one around the table. At the end of that turn, you're going to pick up one of the discard piles, one of the three discard piles, put it in your hand, and then put those three cards on top of your discard pile at the top. So there's this really weird management system of trying to get the right cards into the right discard piles at the right times so that you can get your actions done the way you'd like. Um, it was really good. I failed miserably my first game, but that's not a big deal. Not at all. Um, Palma Flamen which is a trick-taking game from Matthi Matthias Kramer. <laughs> I finally heard his name said out loud by a German person. I was like, oh. So Matthias, Matthias Kramer is the same that did Glenmore and Kraftwagen, and this is a light trick-taking game that he did. Um, it's rather fun and light and simple, and I may even do a quick re review of it or so. Um, the idea is that you need to earn fruit mix cards and fruits. And so you're doing tricks, and if you win a trick, you get first choice of the cards played into that trick, and you're taking them, and some of them have abilities, and some of them help you create mixes, which are banked points for later. Um, it's played over several rounds, and it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, can't I, I, I want to play that with more players and with people who are a little more awake because I think that was one of our 4 a.m. games, so <laughs> more on that later. Uh, next was Domus Domini. Uh, this is that crazy monk game. So the same guy that did Planet Steam did Domus Domini. Um, on, in the game, you are monks trying to make the best brewery, uh, cheese making, and garden that you can, and then you're going to walk your goods up toward the city. And each round, as you walk up the road, anyone ahead of you in the road, you can toss your lay brothers at them and they have to fall back down the road a little bit. So the game is really about knowing which actions are used to further your position and which ones are used to knock back other people. And it was a really weird use of Euro mechanics with very, very strong take that elements. I have that game coming to me soon, so I will reserve too much judgment, but I had a lot of fun. I thought it had a few plays and it left for certain. Uh, just you don't want to get your feelings hurt. That's not the game. Uh, just a few more. <laughs> a few more. Uh, so two more. Uh, we've got to play, it's a it's a reprint from Yellow Games, uh, Nyet, which is a trick-taking game. <laughs> I played a bunch of them. I also have two more I haven't played that are in my house. I happen to like trick-taking games. So Nyet is, uh, you are birds, uh, Russian birds apparently, and in the game you are dealt uh, the deck. So if you're five players, you're dealt fifth of the deck. If you're four players, a fourth of the deck. Um, so you get to see your cards, and then you're going to go around in turn order um, making assessments of the board. So you get to choose who the first player is, what the trump is, what's the super trump, which is one card that trumps any trump. Um, you get to choose what each trick is worth. And so what you're doing is you're eliminating those possibilities. So maybe on my first turn, I'm, I'm so out of yellow, so I say the trump can't be yellow. And the next person goes, well, I 
have plenty of blue, so maybe the term can't be green. And the next person seeing that there's only red or blue left would say, oh, oh, there, Trump is not blue. And so as soon as there's one piece in that same line that's available, that's set for that round. And you're gonna play over several rounds. Uh, it's either said that you will be the dealer twice or you play to a certain number of points. But here's where it really gets interesting. So as soon as you've decided who the first player is, where the trump is, where the points are and all that, the first player gets to arrange the teams for the turn. So let's say you're four players. You can put me and Jim on a team and Sue and Bob on a team. So you kind of like split them up however you like. And then your tricks are gonna count for that team. The next round might be completely different teams and really the most points is what matters. So you don't really have to worry about if that person doesn't do well on the next round. You just want them to do well in this round. It was a really interesting, neat take on trick-taking games. I would love to play it with people I'm more accustomed to playing trick-taking games with because I felt it's harder to read strangers than it is to read my friends that I've played spades with a million times. So I look forward to that one over the holiday especially. It's coming out to the stores any day now and it'll be a really, really good holiday game for me. And the last game I'm going to talk about is the Grand Austria Hotel. And I am positive that if you know anything about this game, you have heard about the downtime issue. So in the game, you are trying to put people into your hotel rooms and treat them well, and it's very cool and interesting. You take this big old pool of dice, it's like 15 million dice, and you roll them and you put them out, and each die is associated with different actions. Um, you go around until everyone's had two actions in the round, and um, so with four players, it's snake drafted around for your different actions. So if I'm player one, player two, player three, player four, and then there'll be player five, six, seven, eight. So I've been the first and the last action in the round. And unfortunately with our four player game, that meant a half hour sitting around, chatting with my friends, knitting a blob, because I'm still learning, um, while I waited for my next action. The board state changes so much in between turns that there's really no good way of planning, so I approximately know what I would like to see on my turn, but I'm not actually positive. When you're the four or five person, you have to take two actions in a row, and sometimes that can be even trickier because you have to trigger your actions in such a way that you've been effective in this in this round where you didn't have the same options other people had. Um, at any time if your action is up, if you'd like you can pass. If uh, all the past people wait until everyone has taken their two actions and then you re-roll whatever dice pool is left minus one. And you can continue doing that and taking a die out and re-rolling the pool until you can see that one or two actions that you were looking for. Um, there are some really good things here. I feel like it's going to be one of those next step couples games. So if you play a lot of two players with the same person, it's going to hold some interest that's got a lot of replayability, just trying to do the best you possibly can and there's some really cool stuff and the art is beautiful. So I actually think it will be a hit. Um, I don't imagine it will be such a hit at four players, though I've seen a lot of four player five tribes in the last couple years and that has the same exact issue where you just can't plan into your next turn very well, so you either take some time and slow down the pace of the game or you have to just take less good actions, but I don't think that's ideal for me. Um, I am totally looking forward to that coming out, and I had a lot of fun playing it anyway. Uh, all right, I'm going to go start editing this together, and then hopefully I will have some more in-depth talk about Galarus for you soon. I also have an unpunched copy of Ponzi Scheme just waiting to get to the table, so I should know more about that soon. I hope you all have a good day.